morning. It's wonderful to be here in this great community. Um, so that was inspiring. That's why I teach at San Jose State, to try to inspire the next generation. <laughs> wonderful. So this is the picture that first inspired me as a college student to become interested in the atmosphere and the environment. This is a picture that comes from NASA satellite data that is of the Antarctic ozone hole. So the blue colors there you see are very, very low concentrations of ozone. That allows a lot of sunlight to pass through, and, um, and that's an issue that obviously is a very large concern. I became particularly interested in this because unintentionally, humans had been releasing some chemicals in the atmosphere that went very high into the stratosphere and had started destroying ozone. And because we know the ozone layer is the protective shield that um, protects the planet from the a sun's harmful radiation, this obviously is very important. So here's a chart that shows how ozone values have changed over the last 50 years. And so you can see that the concentration or the amount of ozone, the thickness of the ozone layer has actually been decreasing. That's what's called ozone depletion. But are you ready for some good news? Here's how ozone levels are going to change in the next 50 years. These are projections from a NASA climate model. And what that says is that the ozone layer is going to recover is that ozone levels are going to come back to what they were. Now, what happened? Well, the science was very clear about ozone depletion. The implications of not doing anything were significant, so the international community decided to phase out ozone-depleting chemicals, and it's starting to work. So this is really great news. This is something that I'm really um, very proud of, in part because as a, as a new um, PhD, I worked in the field of ozone depletion. But more importantly, it shows that science and policy can work together to do something about a potential environmental catastrophe. Now, a question that I find interesting is, what if we had just ignored this issue? What if we didn't regulate ozone-depleting chemicals? What would have happened? We can use the same kind of model and look at projections of how ozone would have changed in the future if we hadn't regulated ozone-depleting gases. This is the future world. And notice how rapidly the amount of ozone and our planet declines. Now, what would that mean for us? Well, by the middle of the century, there'd be so much ultraviolet radiation reaching the surface of the planet that you and I could be sunburned in less than five minutes. Imagine what that would do to plants and animals. We could have totally messed up our ecosystem. But wait, we don't have to go there, right? We didn't do that. We made the right choice. But the ozone hole taught me two, for me, important lessons. One of those is that we can have an effect on our climate system. Even if it's unintentional, we do have that ability. We're, there's a lot of us here, and, and we've invented some interesting chemicals. And secondly, is that we can trust science. The science was able to identify that even small things can make a big difference. And fortunately, we did. We listened to scientists. So let's fast forward to today's contemporary issue. It's already been discussed a little bit this morning, and that is climate change. And here's a, uh, a chart that shows how temperatures of our planet have changed over the last 100 years. So you see the black line, you can see temperatures going up and down, but mainly they've been going up. And in fact, today's temperature is about a degree and a half warmer than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. So what if we did the same thing and said, let's not worry about this, let's not pay attention, and what's going to just happen in the future? We can use a climate model to answer that question. And here's how temperatures would change in the next 90 years. So all those red lines are from different climate models, but they all show the temperature of our planet rising by 8 or 9 degrees by the end of the century. Now, what's that going to mean to us if we live in a planet that, that's, that is that much warmer? We're going to notice. We're all going to notice. In California, most of the Sierra snowpack would be gone. That would have significant implications for water resources in our state, for agriculture. We'll notice higher sea levels, more intense st storms and floods. We're going to notice. But we don't have to do that. This is really our choice. And so it doesn't have to be this way. Now, for myself, I started thinking about this issue and the fact that I don't want to see this trajectory. And so I started thinking, well, what are my own uh, relationship with increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So here's a couple things that I like to do. I like bicycles, and I like burritos. In fact, I like burritos a lot, uh, so much so that I developed a burrito enjoyment index. Um, this is a complicated algorithm that, uh, that tries to determine 
the, uh, how the average American enjoys burritos and compares it with myself. <laughs> and, and so you can see there that it was verified that, in fact, I do like burritos more than the average American. Um, and so I started thinking, well, what impact do my burritos have on our climate system? So I did a burrito showdown, and that is I compared the carbon footprint of a chicken burrito compared to a beef burrito. And, and when I say carbon footprint, I mean the energy required to grow all the different ingredients inside this burrito. And so here's the results of a chicken burrito compared to a beef burrito. And when I first saw this, I was really surprised because I know that when I walk up to my favorite taqueria and I have a choice of what kind of burrito, I didn't realize what a big difference my choice between chicken and beef would be. The beef burrito has five times the carbon footprint as chicken. Now, if I started to make climate-friendly choices in my food decisions, it turns out that I could save about two tons of carbon dioxide per year from my personal carbon footprint. Now, what else could cause a two-ton reduction in carbon emissions? Well, if I took the average American vehicle and I was to replace that with a Toyota Prius, that would also save two tons as well. So these food choices turned out to be quite important. Now, because of my love of bicycles and burritos, uh, one Christmas, I received this as a Christmas present from some dear friends of mine. <laughs> and it says, if you can't read it, 53 miles per burrito. I wonder why they gave that to me. Um, anyhow, they knew I'd love this slogan, and it really did lead me to think, well, how far can I go on a burrito? Now, I am a cyclist, so that's something that I I've, hadn't really thought about, but it was intriguing to me. And so I first thought, well, you know, I'm going to start with like an average burrito, let's say 800 calorie burrito. It would fill up most of us in, in here, and 800 calories is pretty reasonable. And so what if I put that amount of energy into an automobile? So it took the 800 calories of energy and put it into a, a vehicle, that would be like 0.02 gallons or something like that. How far would the car go? So it turns out the average car would go about 0.6 miles, wouldn't go very far. If you put it into a Toyota Prius, yeah, it would go a little further, they're more efficient. But what if you do my preferred option, you put it into me, allow me to eat it, then I get to ride, how far do I go? Drum roll, please. And 21.6 miles. So yes, of course, bicycling is much more efficient than cars. Oh, but what happened to the 53 miles per burrito thing? Well, my only explanation is that's really a super mondo size burrito, <laughs> not an 800 calorie one. So as you can tell, I like doing these kind of calculations. I mean, they're fun, but also learn things about this, about my food choices, about how we move around. And it's, it led me to start thinking about education. And, um, I'll say that as a scientist, that I thought that once society realized that the science about climate change was real and very well studied, that um, the implications of not doing anything were significant and scary, and that we had alternatives that just like in the terms of ozone depletion, that we'd see us move over to a lower carbon economy. But I was wrong. That's not what happened. In fact, despite decades two decades of very strong science, emissions of heat-trapping gases last year were higher than they've ever been before. So although we are making some progress, and you and I see it here uh, in Silicon Valley and cleantech, we're still on that same trajectory. So for me, this was really um, frustrating and ultimately quite disappointing because I understand the science, I see where we're going, and yet we're not making the progress. And so I really didn't know what to do. So I kind of just went back to, to teaching and thinking about my own, um, my own interest and passion in education. And, and I did come to a realization, and, and that realization is, is that scientists, we do have the numbers, we have the data, but we don't necessarily have the ability to tell stories in inspiring and compelling ways to really move society in the direction that is in line with what the science is suggesting. So I took a deep breath. And I decided to leave my academic comfort zone and go outside and ask for help to tell the stories about climate change. And finally, help came. And that is the Green Ninja. So the Green Ninja is a climate action superhero, born from a collaboration between scientists, educators, and people from the visual arts, from animation and from film. The goal of the Green Ninja Project is to educate young people about the science of climate change and give them the tools and inspiration to do something about it. 
The adventures of the Green Ninja are told in a humorous, youth-oriented way, but grounded in science and numbers. Our Green Ninja project, we develop um, animated and live-action films that show the Green Ninja in action, doing things like recycling and composting, transportation, home energy, and of course, issues related to food, like uh, related to burritos and other food choices. We also work directly with, uh, with kids, um, trying to give kids experiences that allow them to see what it's like to, um, to make lower carbon footprint um, choices uh, in our general areas of food, energy, and water. One of these projects is called Foot in the Door, where we ask students to just take a small step towards that lower carbon footprint lifestyle, just to see what it's like. If they enjoy it, they might be more likely to come back at another time. One of our other projects is called Stepping Off the Sidelines, and what that asks people to do is instead of just being a, a spectator watching the game, and the big game here is climate and our changing climate, is to actually get involved in the issue. And we try to develop tools to help people do that. This is one of them. This is a phone application we're developing, which encourages um, people to take action related to climate change within their own neighborhoods and areas, and then share those actions with their community, thereby developing a group of people who are actually taking action together. For me, the Green Ninja Project um, is, has been super enjoyable. It's been really fun. Um, and the goal, that idea of fun, has been my core mission, is to keep it fun and positive. Grounded in science and numbers, but fun, that's really my goal. So for me, the Green Ninja is a, is a, um, it's about taking a step towards what I think should be a better future world. And that's what I mean in terms of uh, a future that I think we could all be excited about. So a lower carbon future would mean using energy from the sun and from the wind. That would produce better air and cleaner water. Uh, a different future would be uh, an agricultural system that's based more on sustainable methods, produce better tasting food and more healthy food. A future would be different ways of moving around, cleaner automobiles, um, public, better public transit, bicycling, walking abilities. I think, for me, that's something that I'm very excited about working towards. So for me, the Green Ninja Project is just a step in that direction, towards that future. We know that sometimes small things can make a big difference. So join me in taking a step towards a better, cleaner, and healthier future. It's going to be good.